This video is an overview of some evidence-based practice principles that you need to know um, to understand the general scope of what else we'll talk about in this course this semester. So these are a few of the things that we would have discussed in class if we were able to meet together. However, I'm going to go ahead and do this in a video. So without further ado, let's go ahead and switch slides. So first of all, um, in the book that we're using for this course, you'll see that there are several different reasons why we would do research to understand different vari uh, variations of explanation on different phenomenon of interest. And so you have a really good chart in your textbook, but I'm gonna go over a few of these, not all of them in depth, but the first one you'll notice is that sometimes we don't know anything about a topic of interest. And so we really need to do some investigation in the very beginning, which we can consider identification. What is this phenomenon that we're witnessing? What is it even called? Um, th those types of investigations are always qualitative, as you see on the slide, because we can't really go ask survey questions about something that we don't even know anything about. How would we construct a survey, say a 15 item questionnaire, to ask about something that we have no idea what it is? Um, and just to kind of reiterate this, to explain it a little bit further um, with an example, early AIDS and HIV research was done as qualitative studies with the means of identifying what in the world was happening. Um, researchers, well, medical um, professionals kept seeing pockets of patients with the same exact characteristics, the same um, obscure, obscure types of pneumonia, um, all coming in with very similar conditions and it started to raise a red flag, like um, something's going on, but we don't know what it is. So how are we going to determine what's going on? They interviewed those first um, participants of um, AIDS and HIV research, and through those early interview studies, the qualitative studies, they were able to determine some patterns among the participants that warranted further investigation. And from that, they were able to go into deeper reasons for doing research. So once they identified the cluster of symptoms and what was going on, then they described it more specifically digging into the symptoms to um, those who were at risk, those who were experiencing these symptoms, what did they have in common, how many people, what was the proportion of people who were experiencing these issues, those types of things. Eventually though, the goal of most quantitative research specifically, is to get to these blue items, the two prediction and control and explanation. Now note that explanation can be done from a qualitative perspective, but most of the time when we talk about explaining something with research, we're looking at quantitative, specifically some kind of clinical trial or a randomized controlled trial. So those final two bullet points are more um, um, specific for figuring out what's causing something, and the other ones are more descriptive in nature, okay? So these are higher level studies. We typically can't see something new happening and jump straight into predicting it because we don't even know what it is. So until we can identify what it is and describe it and explore what those people have in common who are experiencing this phenomenon, then we can't predict who's going to experience it and we can't explain why and we can't develop interventions to treat those types of situations. So it's it's a ladder. We start here and we try to get to these more in, uh, sophisticated types of research methods. Um, there's also several different research purposes linked to evidence-based practice. Not all studies are done with the same premise in mind. Um, the ones that you guys are probably the most familiar with is the one that I turned blue up here, therapy or intervention. Specifically, does this intervention work at decreasing the symptoms of X disease process? Or is this therapy um, helpful for um, preventing say central line bloodstream infections or something like that. So the top bullet, as you see in my note at the bottom, is what we typically think of when we're thinking about evidence-based practice. If we know specific interventions are effective, then we're going to want to make sure our policies and procedures in the workplace reflect those interventions. But we can't do that if we don't know if the interventions work. So most of the study um, topics 
that y'all are going to pick for your poster presentations are going to fall in this umbrella, some sort of therapy or some sort of intervention. And is it effective for specific populations and specific outcomes? However, that's not the only reason that we do research. Sometimes we just want to develop assessment tools or screening tools, such as some of the examples we looked at earlier this semester. For example, the Braden scale, which looks at pressure injury risk. Um, depending on if a patient has specific risk factors, that may make them more at risk, which means we need to do specific interventions for them. Um, that is done, that's a research project, and that's done with the goal of creating valid screening tools for our assessment and practice. Um, prognosis, think about like cancer oncology studies. Um, if someone is diagnosed with stage four um, retinoblastoma, um, that person wants to ask their provider, you know, what is, what's my prognosis look like? How long do I have? Is surgery going to help? Do I need radiation? Do I need chemotherapy? What should I expect as my long-term pro prognosis? Well, we don't know that if we don't research it. So sometimes studies are specifically looking at long-term studies that follow people who have been diagnosed with specific illnesses and they see what the trajectory of that disease looks like over time, depending on what treatments they get. And that helps to inform our practice so we know what to teach patients and their family members in those situations where the unknown um, is, is at play. Um, sometimes we're looking at etiology, which means what's the cause, what's happening behind the scenes, and harm prevention. So there, there's been a big push in the past couple of decades or one decade about car seat safety and changing the way that children ride in vehicles. Um, a lot of that was done looking at this type of research, um, looking at automotive crashes and seeing how the children were restrained um, and what kind of restraints are safer at specific developmental ages and depending on the child's body size and, you know, their age. Um, description is very basic research, like we looked at on the previous slide, but sometimes we need that. Like I said, sometimes things are new. There's, for example, COVID. When COVID hit the, hit the mainstream, we didn't have any idea what that disease was going to look like and how nurses were experiencing it from their perspective. So we needed to do some early description research before we could move into things that were a little bit more intricate. And then lastly, meaning and processes, that definitely sounds qualitative, right? If you thought so, then you'd be correct because meaning and processes are about much more holistic things. So those are definitely going to be qualitative research where we're trying to dig deeper than just the surface of something that we're studying. So here's a review question just to kind of show you how this looks. If you were looking at a study that was testing an innovative strategy to improve patients' comfort, those who had COVID-19, which type of purpose would that study involve? That would be a therapy and intervention question because we're looking at an intervention to see if it's effective at comforting those who have COVID-19. A similar question, a little different, if you're looking at a study that looks at the long-term consequences of some sort of diagnosis, say stage four renal cancer, or breast cancer, um, with metastasis to the liver, then what kind of purpose are you addressing? That's a prognosis question. So those are just a couple of examples to show you how varied research is. And there's so many different avenues that researchers can go into when trying to determine what they want to study and what they're interested in. So one of the main things that I do want to go over in this video is exactly what is evidence-based practice. You know, we say that word, you've heard that word before or that phrase before, but what, what does it even mean? You know, is it just, okay, I've got research, awesome, read these studies, I'm doing evidence-based practice. No, nah, not so much. Um, as you can see, I kind of made this little graphic based on the information in chapter one in your book. Um, it, it's similar to something that's in chapter one, but basically, the outcome of evidence-based practice is that we should be making clinical decisions and we want those clinical decisions to be based on hard good evidence not what we feel like or what's more convenient to us as the nurses now some of that plays a part 
So you'll see that I've kind of separated this wedge out as independent because it's the most important and that's the best evidence. Note what you don't see written here is the word research anywhere on this slide. Now earlier in chapter one, we did talk about research. Well-founded research studies are the best evidence for any type of clinical question. The problem is, as I previously mentioned in class, sometimes we don't have research on specific topics. It's there. It's just too new of a topic. Um, maybe there's some kind of new intervention, innovative thing in practice and just nobody studied it, but we want to try it. We're just not sure. So we might not have research to look at, but maybe we have clinical expertise. Maybe we have position statements from the American Academy of Pediatrics that is recommending this as a new change in practice. You know, if an expert organization is recommending it, that is evidence. It's not as good as looking at the research, but if there's no research, we wanna know what's the best evidence. We need to know that. But that's not all. Evidence does not stand alone. We have to marry it with these other two things. First of all, us as nurses, we have clinical expertise. If you're an expert nurse, you've been around the block a few times, you know what's going to work, you know what's probably not going to work. And so based on your expertise, you can lend your opinions into whether something is going to work or not going to work based on what the research says. It's absolutely imperative that the nurses have a voice in this process, that we're not just reading some random study from Germany and like, okay, let's implement that into practice because it might not work. So we need to look at it from multiple different perspectives. And then the last thing, which of course we cannot um, overlook, is what does the patient want? Um, because a research study could suggest the specific um, um, nutritional shake, a supplement that's like high protein, and we think that it's going to help with wound healing. And science would support that. We know we need protein for wound healing. So if we have these surgical patients who have to get a muscle flap to cover up a huge pressure ulcer, pressure injury, and we're like, okay, twice a day, every day, morning and evening, you have to drink this specific shake for protein for at least three months, and then you'll come back to the clinic and we'll check some things out. That sounds great in theory. It sounds like science would support that. It sounds like a nurse's expertise would support that that should work. But if the patient thinks that the nutritional shakes taste nasty and they're chalky or they're too expensive and they can't afford to buy them, they're not going to do it. So we have to have the patients on board. You have to have the nurses on board. And all of it has to be intermingled with what does the best evidence say. And when we look at all three of those factors, that's evidence-based practice. And we use all three of those factors to help guide our clinical decision making. Our policies and procedures in the workplace should be based on these three things. So please remember, evidence-based practice and research are not the same thing. Research is a component of evidence-based practice, but without these other two things, we're going blindly and implementing just random research that may or may not work. We have to use our clinical judgment as well. So this is the exact same thing that I just said, just in words, um, but I just wanted to double or reiterate again, that research is awesome, we have to have it, but we can't have it by itself. We have to integrate it with those other factors when we're trying to decide what's best for our patients and for our workplaces. Um, so again, we talked about best evidence. What, so what am I talking about? You know, is it a study that had 500 participants from the Philippines? Is that the best evidence? Or is it just a single site study from California and Sacramento that had 3,000 participants, is that the best evidence? Maybe, maybe not. First of all, when we're talking about best evidence, we're talking about primary studies. So a primary study is a study that is written and published by the people who did the work. So I'm not giving you a secondhand account of someone else's study that they did, but I'm telling you about my study that my team and I did, and here's the results, and here's what you need to know about it. That's a primary study. When we get to chapter six, and we're close to our literature search assignment, you're gonna learn a little bit more about primary studies, and we're gonna learn how to figure out whether something's primary or secondary. 
um, there is this thing called synthesized evidence. All synthesized means is that we put together similar things on the same topic to make a bigger um, product. So what in the world does that mean? So that means instead of looking at one study on whether protein shakes are effective for wound healing, we're looking at the results of 20 studies on the same topic from all over the world, and we pull those results results together to get a definitive answer on whether protein shakes are effective for wound healing. So that's what a synthesis is, is it's looking at multiple different studies on the same topic to get a better, bigger picture. Okay. Instead of one study in California, we're looking at studies potentially in Germany, Austria, Egypt, um, the Philippines, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, Canada, like um, Brazil, all over the world potentially. So there are two main types of systematic reviews. That's what I was just talking about. A systematic review is where we search the literature for all relevant studies on a specific topic, and then we dive into it to see what is the answer to our research question. The two different types are meta-analysis, which is just a combination of a bunch of quantitative studies. When you hear the word analysis, think numbers, analyzing numbers, statistical analysis. So a meta-analysis is a systematic review that pulls together a bunch of quantitative studies on the same topic. The metasynthesis, as you might guess, is the same thing, but it's pulling together qualitative studies. So meta-analysis is quantitative, metasynthesis is qualitative. So here's an example. This is an example of a meta-analysis. Um, what I'm looking at is that this is, first of all, we searched for studies on whatever date, and they included 11 randomized controlled trials that included almost 3,000 women. They don't tell us in this section what countries these were from, but later in the article they do. So this is pulling 11 different studies on the same topic, studying the same types of people and the same interventions. So looking at 11 studies from across the world with almost 3,000 people, that's pretty strong evidence. So whatever answer we get from this question, we should be able to trust that more than just one single study done at one specific place. This is an example of a metasynthesis. Again, metasynthesis is qualitative. So this looked at studies that used qualitative methods. They searched for articles and they found, I'm trying to find where this is. Um, it must be on the next page. Oh, here it is. Eight papers. They had eight different studies, which might not sound like a lot, but it actually really is for, because qualitative, you typically don't need as many and you'll learn why later in the semester. Okay, something else that nurses can use are called clinical practice guidelines. So those systematic reviews that I just showed you, meta-analysis and meta-synthesis, they're, they're long. Like some of those can be almost 100 pages long. So I don't know about you, but most of us don't have time to sit and read and pour over a 100-page paper to figure out the answer to our research question. I mean, that would be great if we did, but that's just not feasible for time purposes. So instead, we kind of got the Cliff's Notes version here. This is the too long, didn't read version of a systematic review. So a clinical practice guidelines, think of it as a bulleted or a numbered checklist, like one, do this, two, do that. You don't have to sift, sift through all the fluff. It's just, here's what you need to know. And so here's an example. And previously in class, I showed you a couple of others. You just didn't know that they were called clinical practice guidelines. But this one is from the World Health Organization, and it is looking at specific interventions that are recommended for preventing and treatment, treating postpartum hemorrhage. Um, note the spelling of hemorrhage, because this is from the World Health Organization. Um, so you'll see for each of their recommendations that are numbered, behind it in bold parentheses, it says strong recommendation, moderate quality evidence. Okay, that's what all of those say. So they've done all the legwork for us. They've looked at all the studies. If you scroll to the bottom of this, they have all of the references in case you want to go read them yourself. 
but that's the purpose of doing this is so you don't have to. Um, but we, anything that says strong recommendation, that means the research highly supports that. So more than likely, we need to make sure our policies and our agencies are, are doing that. So you'll see not all of them say that though. So weak recommendation, high quality evidence. That means all these studies were really strong studies and they don't really support this. So this might not be something we need to be doing in practice. Um, you have some more strong, you have a weak recommendation, but it says low quality evidence. So those are some probably not strong studies. I have a separate video on something that's called an evidence hierarchy, and that's gonna explain wh how do we determine whether something is high quality, moderate quality, or low quality. And it has to do with how close to the top of the evidence hierarchy is it, because those tend to be more structured and more rigorous studies. Um, there's some other things just to show you uh, some examples. <laughs> Very low quality evidence. Now we're getting pretty low. That might just be one single study with a super small sample size. So it's like, d is that trustworthy? Can we go with that? I don't, I don't know. Um, and that's the end of the presentation. So hopefully from this, you now know that we do research for many, many different reasons and purposes, um, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. You now should know that evidence-based practice and research are not the same thing. Research is one small component of evidence-based practice, but there's more to it than that. You should also now understand what a systematic review is and be able to differentiate between a meta-analysis and a meta-synthesis. And finally, you should understand what a clinical practice guideline is and how it's different from a systematic review. Um, and the difference is it's small, like easy to read, for the working nurse who's too busy to read a 100 page paper basically. So hopefully this has been helpful um, and thank you for watching.